Ready? Good morning. We will call to order the December 14th, 2021 regular scheduled meeting of the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners. At this time, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Christina Moore, the senior pastor for the Rima Apostolic International Deliverance Center. She will be delivering the invocation this morning. That will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Laura Moss. And we will start the meeting this morning with a moment of silent reflection for our first responders and members of the armed forces. Would everyone please rise? Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity, commissioners, to be able to provide the invocation this morning. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And now we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your unfailing love towards us. We thank you for your mercy, Father. You say in all things give thanks, and therefore we exalt thee and we give you thanks. We thank you for healing that which needs to be healed. We thank you for mending that which needs to be mended. We thank you for restoring that which needs to be restored be restored. Father, we give you all the glory, honor, power, dominion. Lift up a standard of peace against the flood of confusion. Lift up a standard of prosperity against the flood of poverty. Lift up a standard of all that is good against all that is evil. Father, we ask you to bless our county. And in your word, you say, pray for those that are in leadership position and in government. God, we thank you for praying. We pray for them right now. We thank you for healing their minds, their bodies, their spirit, their soul. We thank you for healing their families. God. We thank you for doing that exceedingly abundantly above all we could think and ask for. God, have your way in our lives and our minds. We submit to your plans. We submit to your agenda for you are all seeing, you're omniscient, you're omnipotent. And Father, we thank you for not only blessing the commission, but bless each and every one at the sound of my voice, God. Bring restoration to their house. For you said, if my people which are called by your name will humble ourselves, repent, turn from our wicked ways, then when you hear from heaven and heal life our lands and father we stand in the gap I stand in the gap hallelujah and we thank you for healing not only the lands of this country but healing the lands of our homes our towns our counties and our city and we give you all the praise in Jesus Christ's name amen Selah amen. you know I'd like to add a special thank you to the military and our law enforcement in this county and also fire rescue because they're away from their families uh, on Christmas so that we can enjoy ours. I'd like to extend a special thank you. And I'm inviting a World War II veteran, J. Bird Miller, to uh, lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excuse me, commissioners, if I may say I am a disabled veteran. God bless. Well, Dr. Moore, thank you. I don't know what the other commissioners, but I'm pretty fired up now, so thank you. <laughs> um, commissioners, I'd like to take just a brief moment of chairman's privilege. Today is a uh, special birthday, or not special birthday, but a birthday of someone very special to me. So today, Susan O'Brien is celebrating another trip around the sun. So I would just like to say a big happy birthday out to my wife, Susan. So thank you. Happy birthday. Things I'll do to stay out of the doghouse, you know, just. <laughs> Commissioners, any additions, deletions to the agenda? Any emergency items? Um, I, I don't know that this is a uh, ad addition, but um, I would like to, uh, I think there might be administrative oversight involved in matter number 7F, which is an information item. So I would like to speak to that when the time comes. And it does involve uh, just a single part, the list, which appears in 11A. So however you choose to handle that, uh, Mr. Chair. That's fine. We can, uh, we'll take up 7F when we get to the um, information section. Okay, certainly. Thank you. Make sure it's anything else. Mr. Chairman, move as it stands. Motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams to accept the agenda as presented. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Moving on to presentations and proclamations. Up first, it's going to be my pleasure 
to present a retirement proclamation to Eve Preet for her 27 years and two months of service in the tax collector's office. I see there's a whole contingent here. So Eve, you want to come on up and bring your, your peeps with you? Come on, y'all come up with her. Don't. Stand right behind her and show your support. Anybody not with Eve? <laughs> <laughs> You know, we should have moved this towards the end of the agenda so yeah. they can all sit and watch I our meeting. I don't want to stay. Yeah. So, Eve, <laughs> Eve, it'll be my pleasure to read this, and then if you'd like to make a few comments or anybody else, they'll be more than welcome to, okay? This is a proclamation honoring Eve Preet on her retirement from the Indian River County Office of Tax Collector with 27 years and two months of service. Whereas, Eve Preet will retire from the Indian River County Tax Collector's Office on December 31st, 2021, and whereas Eve has been employed with the tax collector's office since October 20, 1994, starting her career as an accountant and finishing as director of finance. And whereas Eve earned widespread admiration from current and former elected officials and her many co-workers. And whereas Eve has been praised by tax collector Carol Jean Jordan, who stated that Eve will be greatly missed and never replaced because she brought not only her skill, but a patience and grace not often seen in the business world. Her tenure in the finance department resulted in consistent financial excellence, yearly finance awards, and superior audits. And whereas, Eve was lauded by former tax collectors Charlie Sembler and Carl Zimmerman and former assistant tax collector Jeff Smith, who emphasized her kindness, intelligence, extensive financial credentials, and tremendous problem-solving skills. And whereas Eve, over her long tenure, adopted to multiple financial software conversions, expertly meeting each of these time-consuming challenges in a steady, methodical fashion, and whereas Eve, using her remarkable talents as a teacher and mentor, built highly skilled teams capable of multitasking under pressure, improved herself a true leader by leaving her team well-trained and in good hands to carry on after her retirement. And whereas Eve clearly served the public, this county, and the state of Florida with integrity, dedication, and an unsurpassed work ethic. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the Board applauds Eve Preet's efforts on behalf of the tax collector's office, expresses its sincere appreciation for her devoted service, and extends heartfelt wishes for su success in her future endeavors. Adopted this 14th day of December, 2021, signed by myself as chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. Eve, a wonderful career. I don't know how you say anything after that. Uh, commissioners, I had a, a great pleasure of having Eve work for me, and uh, I just can't say enough about this lady, um, how good of a person she is, um, and everything that she did for the tax collector's office while she was there. So thank you very much. And I'm proud to have one of her daughters working for me now. So. <laughs> great. Carl? <laughs> I'll, I'll decline. <laughs> Well, we do have, we all talk a great deal and we write a great deal, so we do have a lot of other uh, uh, things that were sent by Carl and Jeff and, and Charlie Simbler, uh, uh alluding to your amazing talent. And I ju I'm going to say thank you on behalf of each and every one of you or any elected official in this county or somebody running for office, because when they were running for an office that would be affected by our office, I would say, Please come call me, come and see Eve, because Eve will explain it to you. And as she's done always to me, no matter how many times I ask the same question, 
She never says, I told you that before. <laughs> she answers it the same calm, methodical way. And it's a great gift. I mean, when we say a mentor, she's been a mentor to, to many people. The, I'm sure many of you have stopped in the office over time and visited with Eve on what we do and how we do it. Or possibly a, a taxing district would have a question, well, they didn't get quite as much money as they thought they were getting. And Eve never has made a mistake. To my knowledge, in any, in any of our tax distributions, and uh, it's just an amazing gift. I can't say thank you enough. I was uh, happy to inherit her uh, from Jeff and from Charlie and from Carl. And while Carl's going to be quiet, which I cannot believe, <laughs> he did write a beautiful tribute. But I just I cannot say thank you enough to Eve. Uh, I, again, I walked in. She was there, and she made my life easy. But we're going to miss you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good <luck>. I'm going <laughs> to try. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to say a few words. Let me first say it is really hard <laughs> to believe that this many years has gone by. But deciding to retire brings on a lot of emotion. I am so happy to start a new, <coughs> excuse me, chapter in my life but at the same time, sad to leave this all behind. When I started at the tax collector's office back in 1994, my plan was to be here about two years. I never would have thought I would be standing here today. My daughters, Sam and Josie, were only two and one then. Now, my granddaughters, Ren and Rhea, are that same age. Boy, how time flies. I am so proud that both my girls are following in my footsteps, and they both work for Indian River County. Sam is the appeals specialist at the courthouse under Jeff, and Josie is an administrative assistant to HR at the Indian River School District. I know they will both have as successful a career with the county that I have had. When I started this job, there was just me in the accounting department. Now there are six of us in finance and HR. Our office has made so many changes over the years. We didn't even have spreadsheet software when I began. <laughs> now everything is processed automatically, electronically, and online. It is amazing to think where we have come. I just can't imagine what it will be like in the next 27 years. <laughs> but as I think back over the years and all the changes, the people are what I remember the most. Some have moved on to other things. Some have retired. Some have left and come back, and some we have lost. I am thankful and honored to have worked with each and every one of them, and especially the ones I'm leaving behind now. I want to say a special thank you to Rhonda, Kelly, Ryan, Wendy, Brad, and our newest member, Leanne. Sorry. You have all made my job a pleasure to come to every day, and the camaraderie we have developed, I will greatly miss. I leave my position knowing Carol Jean and our finance department will be in great hands at, with Brad at the reins. I want to especially thank my husband, Paul, for all, for all he has done. <laughs> he supported and encouraged me to earn my Certified Government Finance Officer's designation, my MBA, and my CPA license all during my time here. I couldn't have done it without his love and support. I owe a ton of gratitude to Carol Jean Jordan for her trust and confidence all these years, Carl Zimmerman for taking a chance on me, <clears throat> and for Charlie Sembler for his support and encouragement. A special thank you goes out to Jeff Smith, our Clerk of Circuit Court. He was my mentor for quite a few years while he was the assistant tax collector, and for him I am thankful. Debbie G., Adria Espick, and Lori Bloom have been my longest co-workers and, more importantly, dear, dear friends. We have been through so much together and seen so many changes. It has been my pleasure to work with all of you. There are so many others I would love to thank, but there are just too many to mention. 
I feel honored and humbled to have been a member of the tax collector's office for so long. And I am so proud to have been able to serve the citizens of Indian River County. Thank you all so much for being a part of my life. I am truly grateful. Well, Eve, come on up and get your proclamation here and, and bring everybody with you. We'll get a big, uh, big group photo. Somebody's going to start the receiving line. Congratulations and thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I don't know why you accepted her. Lovely to meet you guys. Thank you. This is your seat. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You know I can't wear red. Dave, you get up here with uh, Eve, get Chuck, the girls, everybody else got up. We're going to get this here. crowd in. Back up with the cameras. Yeah. I don't think Jeff's going to stand in the front row. Thank you, Carl, for being here today. Give everyone just a minute to clear the aisles. The Harbor Branch trucks here. You said you got a presentation they want to show? Okay. All right, moving on. The next is a presentation of a proclamation celebrating the 50th anniversary of Fort Atlantic University Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. This will be presented by Commissioner or Vice Chairman Ehrman, and we have some folks from Harbor Branch here, so come on up. Good morning, welcome. Before the video? Oh, okay, wonderful. Good morning. I believe um, we're going to start with just a quick video that talks about Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, what we did yesterday, what we do today, and what we hope to do going in. It generates life sustaining oxygen and creates rain, feeding our crops and us. Even medicines are found in its depths. The ocean is essential for all life on Earth. Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute is a renowned center for innovation and solution-oriented ocean research. Its top-tier education programs address some of the most pressing issues facing our seas and us. The ocean teems with life that has the potential of unlocking cures and treatments to devastating diseases. To improve human health, we must protect ocean health. Having access to state-of-the-art tools allows our researchers to discover and safeguard potential therapeutics from the oceans. But while the ocean is a source of cures, it can also be a source of illness. That's why FAU Harbor Branch scientists are studying harmful algal blooms and other toxins and pollutants in our environment to understand their direct impacts on ecosystems and human health. From seaweed to fish, FAU Harbor Branch leads the way in advancing aquaculture through one of the longest-running programs of its kind in the world. Scientists collaborate with academia, government, 
private sector, nonprofit institutions, and foundations to research and develop pioneering solutions to sustainably feed the world and replenish depleted fish stocks. Ocean exploration is the foundation upon which FAU Harbor Branch was built, and it continues to be at the forefront of our research efforts. Inspired by our founder's legacy, we develop revolutionary and cutting-edge technologies. Unmanned robotic vehicles enable us to unveil the mysteries of our coastal and ocean ecosystems. Laser imaging, sensors, and optical technology give us a chance to view the ocean in ways never seen before while providing security benefits to the nation's coastline. And our exploration of the safe and responsible use of marine renewable energy from the Gulf Stream is putting an alternative power source for the nation within reach. As environmental changes continue to impact our world, marine ecosystem conservation is more vital than ever. From diverse habitats like seagrass meadows and coral reefs to the protected marine life they support, FAU Harbor Branch scientists examine their responses to pressures from coastal land development. They investigate nutrient and plastics pollution, ocean acidification, warming temperatures, and overfishing. Five decades of research has yielded a treasure trove of long-term data sets related to the Arctic, the Caribbean, and the farthest stretches of the Indian River Lagoon. Current research builds on this history to better understand coastal systems and wildlife to ensure their survival for generations to come. FAU Harbor Branch is inspiring the next generation of marine scientists and ocean stewards through a distinctive set of formal and informal educational programs for driven high school students to PhD candidates. Graduate and undergraduate programs offer opportunities for students to work alongside leading experts and gain hands-on experience conducting trailblazing research in marine science, engineering, or related fields. And ocean discovery outreach programs offer community members opportunities to connect with and learn directly from marine science experts through lectures, tours, and public events. Our work would not be possible without supporters around the world. Humanity has a limited window of opportunity to use our capacity for research and innovation to ensure the oceans can sustain us all for many years to come. However, we need your help to do so. We can only make a difference together. That's why we believe in ocean science for a better world. Thank you for allowing the time to play that short video. I think it encapsulates a lot of the important work we're doing now at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. So again, I'm Kara Perry. I'm with Florida Atlantic University, and I'm joined this morning by one of our Board of Trustees members, uh, Alicia Morris. She's also a Vero Beach resident. She's relatively new to the board, and she waves the flag for the Treasure Coast for us on the Board of Trustees. So thank you, Alicia, for being here. Um, I'd like to thank you, the Indian River County Commission, for allowing this, us, us this opportunity and recognizing this amazing milestone for Harbor Branch. Also, Indian River County is a sponsor of our 50th celebration. All three Treasure Coast counties joined on as a sponsor this year, and we really appreciate the support. Um, the support that you provide means everything, and our work wouldn't be possible without it. Um, we can only make a difference together. And that's why we're here to celebrate the rich history and the future of ocean science for a better world at FAU Harbor Branch. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman Yearman, if you'd like to make the presentation, please. I would. Uh, it's an honor to do this proclamation. Mr. Chairman, I, I, do, have a, I do have a quick story before. I yes, read please. You've heard in the video, it, it, it talked about the legacy of the founder. And, and you'll hear me mention in this proclamation uh, the name Edwin Link. As a uh, probably a 10-year-old kid, my grandmother was really good friends with his wife, Marilyn Lincoln. I, I got to go down there to Harbor Branch uh, many times as, as a young, you know, just a young guy just looking at all these neat things they had. And when my grandmother and Mrs. Link would go off and, and you know, chit-chat and talk, Mr. Link used to tell me, he goes, Joe, come with me. And I got to go with him around the 
the, all the Harbor Branch campus when it was very new, they just built their house there. The sea diver was there. The, the deep diver was just was just being planned and was in his infancy with the, with the, the submarine that, that that he that he mastered. So it, it was pretty incredible experience for for a young man like myself to uh, have known him. A uh, little bit about Mr. Link. If you don't know, Mr. Link invented the Link Trainer, who's used still today for aircraft pilots to train because he himself was a pilot and he said there ought to be a better way than crashing airplanes. And, and, uh, and so he invented the Link Trainer, which is a simulator that's basically still used today in, uh, in the world of aviation. But uh, I just wanted to relate a story that I was, uh, I was a benefactor of Harbor Branch early on in my, in my life. But, you know, it, it was such a, such a treat to have uh, Mr. Link you know, take me around numerous times every time I would go down there, and it was it was pretty cool. But, but with that, I'd like to read this proclamation celebrating the 50th anniversary of Florida Atlantic University Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. Whereas, being founded in 1971 by Seward Johnson and Edwin Link, Florida Atlantic University Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute has provided 50 years of groundbreaking research and exploration to address the critical issues facing our oceans, thereby positively impacting human health and well-being. And whereas from developing new cancer therapies to working on cutting edge aquaculture techniques for global foods, food security to tackling toxic algae blooms, FAU Harbor Branch has remained steadfast in the pursuit of ocean science for a better world. And whereas over the course of 50 years of program expansion at FAU Harbor Branch, marine scientists, engineers, educators, and students have served as valuable community resources, increasing their reach to over 100 miles along Florida's East Coast and establishing Harbor Branch as a worldwide trusted leader for marine and ocean science, conservation, and education. And whereas FAU Harbor Branch was founded in the spirit of ocean exploration, to unveil the mysteries of the deep, and whereas to this day, FAU Harbor Branch relentlessly pursues innovative ocean research while providing top tier educational programs that will lead to humankind to solve the most pressing issues facing our oceans. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that Florida Atlantic University Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute is hereby congratulated on 50 years of world-class research fueled by the spirit of ocean exploration. Adopted this 14th day of December, 2021 and signed by all five county commissioners. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I have to say, I'm jealous that you met Mr. Link in person. <laughs> all right, well, Kara, come on up. <laughs> This morning. Take a big group photo. <coughs> and one more. Thank you, guys. And if I can get one. Oh, hold up, hold up. Thank you. Thank you. So I was told this was going to be the FAU or your 50th Branch Christmas card. <coughs> So. Mention quickly that the Johnson Sea Link submersible is on a grand exhibit at the Elliott Museum in Stewart throughout this whole academic year. So if you would like to see it and learn more about the history there, it's at the Elliott. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. <clears throat> Moving on to minutes, we have the regular meeting of October 5th, 2021, and an excerpt from the December 7, 2021, item 10. A3, the final public hearing and discussion of 2021 redistricting of county commissioner districts. Ms. Chair, move uh, approval for the regular meeting of October 5th, 2021, as well as the excerpt from the December 7th, 2021 meeting. Second. We have a motion, Commissioner Flesher, second by Vice Chairman Ehrman. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5 0.
Under informational items, we do have a retirement proclamation for James W. O'Neill. He is retiring from the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners, Department of Utility Services, Water Distribution with 32 years of service. So uh, Jim, we, uh, we appreciate your service to the county and to our utility customers. We do have the uh, uh, forthcoming closure and collection service changes for Christmas and New Year's Day um, for waste, yard, and recycling collections. We also have the um, Indian River County venue event calendar and just a couple highlights. Mm. One is the uh, always popular Commissioner O'Brien South County meeting on January 3rd at the IG Center. We do have a home show at the fairgrounds January 15th and 16th with free admission. A Vero Beach Antiques Festival at the fairgrounds January 8th and 9th. And it's not on here, commissioners, but a little spoiler alert. In early February, we're hosting a hot air balloon festival at the fairgrounds. And that looks like really cool. It's going to be Saturday and Sunday, I think, February 2nd and 3rd, something like that. And Saturday night, they're going to do some big laser show with the hot air balloons and the whole nine works going. So uh, it should be a pretty good time out there. So I'm looking forward to that. So. And that's all I have. Uh, Commissioner Moss, you had uh, comments on item 7F. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just by way of background, um, I've served on the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee since uh, 2016. And as you may know, uh, this past year, there's been a bit of turmoil with uh, Bill Shute leaving and also the uh, chairwoman of the committee resigning uh, recently and uh, unexpectedly. But at any rate, it looks uh, like on one list I'm on and an another list I'm not. So I, I was thinking perhaps it was administrative oversight in that regard. On the uh, 2022 committee assignments by commissioner, I am not listed. But on the, uh, and, and now I'm referring to 11A, on the designated uh, point persons and alternatives for 2022 state legislative list of priorities, I am listed as the uh, State Housing Initiatives Partnership slash uh, affordable housing. So I wish to continue on affordable housing. I mean, I understand that you make the decision, uh, but I think it's especially important this year because, well, we finally have money. Um, you know, it's been a problem, um, I would say, with morale, having served on, uh, on AHAC since 2016. You know, not having the funding to work on projects has been very, very difficult, and I think that might account uh, for some of the turmoil we have seen. But we, for the community, we finally do have funding for some of these projects. And uh, SHIP, really, is the foundation, and affordable housing uh, sits on top of that. So I think, you know, you really need to have both. So I, w I would request... Um, or I don't know if I need, even need to make the request or if it's an administrative oversight because it, 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 it doesn't mesh. But if I need to make that request, then I would like to make that request. That I, that just that I continue. This is nothing new. Um, I, this is a position that I uh, currently occupy. Yeah, so thank you, Commissioner Moss. Uh, just address both of them. As far as the committee assignments, when I looked at around the county, it, it just seems to me that the Felsmere area probably has the most critical need for affordable housing. And so I thought that it would be appropriate for Commissioner Adams to take that on and, and take, tackle that. As far as the 11A, the designated point persons, um, I, I left you as the lead person for the state housing initiatives because I was, I was aware of your advocacy for affordable housing for many years and thought that you uh, would, would certainly be still willing to take that on. And that also, part of it was just a balancing act. I, I tried to make sure each commissioner had the same number of uh, point person positions and also alter, alternate positions. Um, and so for those two reasons, I, I felt that you would still be able to serve as our point person for the, the affordable housing and, and SHIP. So if you're, if you're good with still serving as a point person, I would like you to, to remain as that. Yes, I would, I, I would like to do that. I guess the, the other question I have then, um, and I, I still, again, I would wish to continue on uh, Affordable Housing Advisory uh, Committee, but I understand it's, it's your decision and, and I respect that. 
Uh, but I did, over the years, uh, attend meetings, Affordable Housing Advisory Committee meetings, where two commissioners were present and both spoke. Uh, for example, there was one meeting where Commissioner uh, Zork and Commissioner Solari both were present and both spoke at that meeting. So I guess that, I mean, if, if we can do that, then that would seem to be uh, the most amiable solution. And I've well, seen, Dylan, I've seen you it can done correct me past. if I'm wrong, but I believe those meetings are publicly noticed in, in the sh in the sunshine, and minutes are right. kept. And oh, would be. So it, it, I don't see that there's a violation if, if a second commissioner wishes to speak. No, not all. And, and I would like to clarify. I, my recollection was is that Commissioner Zorik, there was a specific topic, I think, that Commissioner Zorik had raised while he was on the commission, and he had said that he was going to then, you know, talk about it at AHAC. Um, so I, I remember that was kind of the context of it. But Jason, do you, your recollection of that? Yeah, I think that's, you know, kind of like a, a one-off type of thing. Like if there's a particular matter that, that's, that's being presented, I think that's what, what Commissioner Zork was doing on that, on, that, on that one typical thing. Okay. Where we, so it do, we probably would not have two in attendance. At, at, okay. in a, at I would regular. just add yeah. that actually, <clears throat> Commissioner Flash, I, it might have been in 04 or 05, but sometime before I came on the board, it used to be that the county commissioner would serve as a chairperson of these committees. And the board at that time, and again, I don't know if it's 04 or 05, but they um, made a decision that the, the county commission representatives would only be the liaison. <clears throat> and I think the thought process was they, they didn't want the commissioner steering discussion and topics so much as just reporting back to the board. And so I think that's why they made the change that the commissioners are just liaison. So I, I think it would be a very rare instance where another commissioner would have to come in and, and interject in, in a committee meeting, but it, it's legal. Just I think we, we want these committees for the citizens to have input and give direction and advice to the county commission. And then if we want to direct something, we do it up here on the dais. Um, and I, I agree with what you're saying. More recently, the uh, liaison has become a voting member unless that changes, but, but currently the uh, county commissioner is a uh, voting member of the Affordable correct, Housing Bill? Advisory okay. Committee. Uh, that, that changed recently. So there, as I said, there been, there, there's been a bit of uh, turmoil in that area. But I, um, res I respect your decision and uh, if, you know, if I'm free to attend and to participate right. when I feel it's warranted, then uh, I'm happy to do that and thank okay. you. Very good. And then we will still discuss 11A when we get to that uh, in the county administrator. All right. Commissioners, consent agenda. Does anybody have anything they wish to pull for further discussion? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull 8I. Commissioner Vice Chairman Ehrman is pulling 8I. Thank you. Commissioners, I would like to pull 8D and 8E for further discussion. Is there anyone from the audience that wishes to have a consent agenda item pulled for further discussion? Seeing none, commissioners? Mr. Chair, move approval as amended. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Vice Chairman Ehrman. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Commissioner Ehrman, we will go ahead and start with your item 8-I. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is strictly just 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 informational. I, I want to make sure that it doesn't get lost in the consent agenda for the general public. This is a, a signalization at 66th Avenue in 8th Street that is uh, long overdue. And I think people are going to be glad to see it. And and I and also recently, uh, I want to thank the county administrator and Rich and his staff for also putting up a flashing red at on the stop sign at 66th Avenue and 4th Street. So those should be some in, important uh, assets and improvement to the county. And Jason, I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate. I think it, it did say in the back of material that due to supply restraints, some of this may be it may still take a little longer than we thought, but, the, but at least our, our end of the process is in the process. Right, correct. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Uh, the There is a pretty long lead time on the mast arms right now, I think about nine months, Rich, uh, for the mast arms. So there will, we, with, with this approval, 
the, the wheels will start spinning on that. We can place the order, so it'll be about nine months to get those in. What we're gonna do is, as it mentions in the item, is hold off on the notice to proceed for the contractor to go out and do the work to, to prepare the, the intersection for the, for the mast arms because we don't want it all torn up out there for nine months while we're waiting. So you won't see construction activity happening until it's getting a little closer for the mast arms to get here. So, um, but, uh, but we are excited to, uh, to, to get this project done and uh, have, have a signalized intersection there going forward. Again, thank, thank you. Thank you, staff, for, for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll move staff uh, recommendation. Second. Uh, motion by uh, Vice Chairman Ehrman, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Um, item 8D is a quarterly tourist development tax report from our um, clerk. And Jeff, it uh, looks like we rebounded pretty nicely from a year ago. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Jeff Smith, Clerk of the Court and Comptroller. Um, I went back and looked at uh, September, the same quarter back in September of 19 and compared it because September of 20 was kind of, you know, an odd year with the pandemic. But uh, back in 19, we had a total of $516,000 worth of tax. So you can see that um, we jumped big time for the last two years. And we're seeing that along the East Coast, Brevard, Martin County, St. Lucie County are experiencing the same thing. So it's just a happening place here right now. And I think it's partly due to the weather, partly due to the openness that we have here in Florida and, and just what we've got to offer here in Indian River County. So we're doing a bang up job. Very good. And then the next item, the audit, I, I did notice that you did um, go back and find some other collections and you're continually going back and um, right. watching these accounts to make sure that the hotels or, or uh, vacation rentals are collecting the tax and passing it on. Yep, uh, my internal auditor has done a really good job of that um, and he's got some more stuff on the horizon to, to look at. But yes, we are constantly looking at um, the hotels and short-term rentals to make sure not only that they're paying the ones that we went back and got the you know the prior tax but also that they're paying current concurrently so yes very good thank you uh, mr vice chairman would you do me the favor of making a motion to accept item 8d please uh, mr chairman i'd be glad to and i'll second that on uh, motion by vice chairman Ehrman, second by myself all in favor signify with aye, aye. any opposed that carries five zero Jeff, while you're there, item 8E is the Internal Audit Division Annual Report. And commissioners, I, I pulled this just to call your attention to it. If you looked at the backup report, it is a comprehensive list of all the things that the clerk does. Um, you know, every, everything from looking at the, the constitutional reports, the internal audits, and, and everything in between. And I just want to commend Jeff and his staff for, for what you guys do to you know make sure that we're as straight and narrow as we can be and it's good to know that you're you're watching over everything and so i just want to thank you and your staff for all you do here um it's a it's you know basically a two-page list of all these different things that you guys audit every year so i really appreciate it thank you yeah I, i've got to give kudos to ed halsey my internal auditor he's taken the bull and really run with it um under my instruction i told him what i wanted and he's really done a good job with it there's a couple things here I'd like to highlight. One is that uh, two of the charities that are funded by CSAC, he actually went out and visited them this year and observed what was going on just to make sure. And now he's comparing that to the uh, grant applications that CSAC had received to make sure that everything is corresponding there. So we are doing the internal audit work that we said we would do. And I just wanted to highlight that for you. Awesome, very good. Thank you, Jeff. Mr. Chairman, before I'm uh, <coughs> motion, I would like to also say that when I, you know, first took this job and I sat down with Jeff Smith of all the stuff they do, it's just absolutely incredible. They they keep they keep up with it like they do and as well as they do. And I appreciate everything you and your office does. With that, I'll make a motion to accept. Second. All in favor of the motion, signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries five zero. And Jeff, I didn't pull it, but under eight N the cash and surplus investment policy, no cryptocurrency? No. Come, come on, man. That's where the big bucks are. Now, uh, we looked at it. We had a current 
uh, we have a quarterly meeting of the investment committee and and I've got to give kudos to my finance director, Alyssa Nagy, for reviewing that and seeing that that even though it's not in the state law that we can't invest in cryptocurrency, uh, she noticed that our policy didn't address it. So uh, she brought it up to the committee and we all agreed that we needed to uh, have that in the policy. So uh, I learned a long time ago two things about investing. One is if you don't understand it, don't invest in it. And I don't understand cryptocurrency <laughs> and I don't think any of us here do. And number two, I don't want to risk taxpayer dollars in something that may or may not be, you know, good. Yep. So. No, I, I hear you, Jeff. I just think it's funny that we have that in our policy now. So thank you. Um, commissioners, with your indulgence, um, I'd like to go ahead and move my item 14A1 up to do, I think we can do this real quick. This is the um, Bureau of Beach Air Show's request to use the county administration building. Oh, approval. We have a motion by um, Commissioner Fletcher, second by Commissioner Adams. Um, the only thing I will say that, uh, and basically this is for the volunteers to use the county administration building, the parking, so they can shuttle the volunteers back and forth to the airport for the Vero Beach Air Show, which does have the Blue Angels coming this year. And my only condition I put on this, and I, I hope you'll carry the message back, is the Angels have to fly low, they have to fly fast, and they have to fly loud, and that's the condition. We, we have a deal? Okay, because I, I, you know, I'll be glad to take any complaints, any heat. I look at that as a sound of freedom when those jets are flying overhead, and they can't fly fast or loud enough for me. So just you let them know we're all behind them when they come here in April. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, come on up and introduce yourself. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Administrator Brown, Rob Lucas, Vice President of the Vero Beach Air Show Board. Um, again, we were awarded the F-16 demo team again, so they'll be here in addition to the Blue Angels this year. So we'll have a lot of loud, fast, and low. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Even better. And, and what are the dates of that air show again, just so the audience can hear? April 30th and May 1st. April 30th and May 1st. Okay. Awesome. We will look forward to a lot of loud noise that weekend. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chair, if I oh, oh, yeah, Jason. typically provided things like VMS boards, you know, the message boards for air show parking over here or whatever in the past. So, you know, that's open offer for any of that stuff that you guys need going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. Is there any discussion on this? Any comment from the public? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Thank you, Commissioners. Moving to constitutional officers, Indian River County Supervisor of Elections, Leslie R. Swan, reimbursement for conducting the November 2, 2021 municipal elections. Good morning, Ms. Swan. Good morning, Chairman O'Brien and Commissioners. I'm here today, as you said, to ask for reimbursement for the funds that we collected for conducting the November 2nd municipal elections for the city of Felsmere, Sebastian, and Vero Beach. Move approval for this request. Second. Did you give a second on that, Commissioner? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Either way. Yeah. Ah. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5 0. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much. All right, have a great day. Next is the uh, Indian River County Sheriff, Eric Flowers. Requesting access to county traffic cameras. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you so much for uh, taking time on your agenda today to uh, address this item. Uh, I met individually with each of you last week with our partners at Flock, and uh, I just want to start off by saying, you know, I was elected uh, in 2020. Uh, part of my campaign promise was to keep our community safe, to leverage technology, and to be as progressive as we can uh, in ways that we can protect our community. And one of those things that I've done is back in July, uh, I uh, signed a contract with a company called Flock to uh, install license plate readers uh, around Indian River County. This is something that uh, other communities are doing, uh, and I can tell you that uh, they are proven to make communities safer. Uh, Flock has shown that their uh, presence uh, can result in up to a 70% reduction in crime for flock related communities as I told you they all start they started as a neighborhood watch 
um, HOA type company. And uh, actually my community Point West that I live in has now purchased and is installing the, in the process of installing nine of these license plate readers inside of the Point West community. Uh, we currently have about 20 of these license plate readers in operation. Uh, I purchased 48 of them on a lease, uh, which uh, we're looking to complete the permits uh, with, with uh, the county approval. We're in the permitting process uh, to get those done uh, in the near future. Um, the uh, one of the challenges that we have right now is Department of Transportation. Uh, State Florida Department of Transportation is not um, working with us as they have in the past. Um, they um, were told by the previous governor that they should work with law enforcement. And uh, I expect this year in our legislative session, having talked with uh, Representative Grawl and uh, Representative Snyder, uh, that we are going to see some legislation specific to this uh, this year, um, both in the oversight side and with getting DOT to comply uh, with our request to place this technology on their equipment as well. Um, I have a map that we can show uh, that will show you where the locations of the license plate readers uh, are in Indian River County. Um, you guys can see uh, the, where they're going. This is not where they are. This is the 48 cameras that we're in the process of installing. The idea here is to uh, capture uh, folks that are coming in and out of our community uh, that are potentially committing crimes. And I can tell you with just the 20 that we have in place, we've already, uh, the, the first uh, license plate readers went in in September uh, and we've already recovered six stolen vehicles as a result of these, uh, four stolen license plates. Uh, we have recovered, we've had two grand thefts that have been solved as a result of this technology. And uh, the one that I'm most proud of is we had a missing persons case. It was out of Illinois. It was a custodial kidnapping case and we were able to recover some children. Uh, that were missing out of Illinois as a result of this technology. So uh, Mr. Walsh is here with me today, John Walsh from America's Most Wanted. He's going to talk to you for a few moments about um, what this technology can do. But I, I, my ultimate ask of you today is to approve us to have access to the traffic cameras, the county's traffic cameras. Um, I have established a real-time crime center at the Indy River County Sheriff's Office. The uh, real-time crime center would be enhanced by having access to those cameras. Uh, we're, these, this is not red light technology. This is in no way, uh, you know, writing citations this is in no way uh, worried about uh, you know driver's license and driving infractions or any of that kind of stuff the purpose of this is when we have that person who uh, is listed as a, a silver alert when we have that person that's listed as a, a blue alert in the case of law enforcement an amber alert in the case of a missing child when we've got somebody who's a dangerous felon that's on the loose we're going to get notified the second that they cross paths with one of these cameras and our real-time crime center using those traffic cameras would be able to update our patrol folks on where that vehicle is traveling to be able to make a stop effectuate an arrest and make our community safer immediately so i'm excited about this uh, this is one of the steps in, in the ways that i feel we can better uh, enhance uh, our safety in our community and i think it's going to be a good thing for us so um, with your uh, indulgence i'm going to invite mr walsh down to talk for a moment uh, and then i'll be happy to answer any of your questions mr walsh if you will uh, if you have a few things to say good morning and welcome Thank you very much for the time, uh, commissioners. Um, I live in this county. I raise my adult children here. I'm raising my grandchildren here. And I would love to see it be the safest county in all of Florida. And since my six-year-old son, Adam, was kidnapped and murdered in 1981, I have spent my whole life since that time trying to catch bad guys and figure out how to make America safer. I think we've all seen this huge spike in crime uh, in this last past year, and um, what Eric is talking about this technology, I have seen it. I actually went to England, did some cases with Scotland Yard and uh, Interpol with the world's most wanted, and saw what they've done over there. London may be the safest big city in the world. They surround it in what they call a ring of steel, which is plate readers and cameras. And they have 1.8 million cameras in England. And their philosophy is the same as mine. If we can find missing children, if we can stop criminals, if we can get stolen cars, cars that were used in, the, in uh, crimes, if we can save police officers, this has been the deadliest year this past year for law enforcement in the history of the United States. These plate readers can alert a deputy out on the road who may be pulling over a car not knowing who's in there but a plate reader and a camera combined will flash into his car and say, wait, these two guys just murdered someone at a 7-Eleven and that's a stolen car. Be on the alert. It saves lives. Um, I've seen it all over the world. 
England being the one to use it the best. And when, when Eric says um, that they were proudest of recovering a missing child, it took three years for Congress to debate putting Amber Alerts on road signs and using the emergency broadcast system. I paid my own way up there 10 times. It was a nightmare. But when it was finally passed, the first year that the Amber Alerts were put into place and our National Center for Missing Exploited Children, our nonprofit in DC, disperse Amber Alerts all over the country, the first year 117 kids were gotten back alive that had been kidnapped by those signs on the roads, radio, television, and plate readers, 117 kids were gotten back alive because of this technology. So um, I know that commissioner over there, Flesher, has been a great supporter of this, and thank you very much, Joe. Um, and I, ha as I said, I have traveled the world. I've met every kind of cop in the last 30 plus years. And I must say, Eric Flowers is one of the finest cops yep. I have met. One of the most modern 21st century cops. I live in this county. I knew all the other sheriffs and most of the chiefs. And uh, I've got to say, Eric is on the cutting edge of, of fighting crime with technology. And I would, I would suggest in the, in the future, you look at more cameras. We want Indian River County to be safer. Look at more plate readers. They save lives. They, they up the conviction rate for DAs all over the world. When you have the video, we just watched two trials that the outcomes were very decisive because of video, because of cameras. And those juries did the right things because they were able to see in real time. But the plate readers saved lives, the cameras helped Cops save them, uh, us from the bad guys that are coming in and out of this county, and it helps the criminal justice system, especially DAs, get convictions, convictions on the bad guys. So uh, I thank you for your time. I urge you to look at this and expanding it. I don't think we have enough ca cameras in this county. This huge crime spike in the country, homicides are out of control, carjackings, uh, it's the worst crime rate since the Civil War. So I'm a great believer in technology and being proactive. Look at more cameras, look at more plate readers, and give these guys and women that are risking their lives every day out there a chance to come home alive at night. So thank you for your time, much appreciated. Mr. Walsh, thank you for being here this morning. Appreciate it, thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Fletcher. You know, can I just say, move approval for the sheriff's request in full support. Second. We have a motion and a second. Just any uh, commissioners, any questions for the sheriff? Commissioner Adams. So are we, is, or I actually have a question for commissioners and then a question for the sheriff. Sure. Is this a motion for the traffic camera access or is this a motion for license plate readers because it's a little unclear to me what <clears throat> is specifically being asked for today the sheriff does not need uh, permission or authorization for the lprs but the sheriff does need permission for access to our cameras and uh, again i could share the same stories as uh, jo mr john walsh has just shared uh, having been in Scotland Yard and, and watched the growth of the camera network and seeing also in my, my former occup occupation in New York City, uh, the cameras save lives. And, and I'd also prevent. like to mention, so, not recording the cameras in any way whatsoever. Uh, you give us access to traffic cameras. It's simply real-time access for us to be able to use in conjunction with the license plate readers. It will not be recorded. It's not anything like that. Um, it, and there's going to be a delay in talking with uh, the county administrator. It's going to take us a little bit of time to make the connection, to make all this happen. Uh, and there's a cost associated with it, which, of course, we'll have to find in my budget as well. So it's on my end. Right. So that's what I really wanted to seek clarification on because... Sure. The motion implies this is going to happen tomorrow, but no. the reality is that there needs to be fiber put in, connections need to be made, policies need to be put in place about access and control and read only and all that kind of stuff. So I just I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, 
because there really hasn't been a lot of discussion about that. And I, I want to be the first to say the policy decision on license plate readers is on me. It's absolutely on me 100%. I made that decision to do this for our community. That is not on the county commission in any way. I just wanted to be abundantly clear with you and the public. Uh, there's an article in the newspaper today about it. That's the purpose of this, is for us to have access to the traffic cameras to enhance what we're doing with license plate readers. Jason? In a, a th thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Sheriff. Just a, just a couple clarification points. I, I'd like to get direction generally from the board on, on both of the items. One thing is the traffic cameras. It is read only, so th the sheriff won't be out there turning cameras around and you know moving. They'll basically see what whatever it is we're providing them, um, and we can we will need to do a fiber project because right now our our conduit for the fiber to get to the sheriff's office is, is full and we need to do a larger one. Um, so that, that is gonna be an expense. It's something that we would need to do anyway um, at, at some point, but uh, that'll probably be nine to 12 months to get that, that new fiber in so that we can accommodate this. Um, and then the license plate readers are, our right of way ordinances don't really address license plate readers. So I just kind of wanted to have this also at a public meeting for transparency purposes that the board is good with authorizing the license plate readers because staff doesn't have any, there's, there's nothing in our code that, that precludes the license plate readers, but we just wanted to make sure that the board was, was good with that, you know, with, with us allowing that because we've been working with the sheriff's office. We've got the, um, they've been going through the permitting process. I think many of those permits are ready to go. We just wanted to make sure that this was, this was okayed, you know, at, at a, at a public meeting for transparency purposes and absolutely thought it should be a, a, a board and, policy decision. So what I would suggest is uh, commissioner Flesher, if you'd like to amend your motion, not only to approve access to the county traffic cameras, but also to allow the license plate readers to be installed in county right away. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe that uh, it, it's required, but I'm happy to do that. Uh, I, I think with the county minister, I, I think this just really clarifies it and, and gets it straight. So um, I would appreciate if you would amend it. And it, Yes, I, I will. Yep. And uh, as far as uh, what the sheriff has indicated, there will be uh, legislation that's uh, actually moving uh, to ensure that uh, that one hurdle it doesn't exist in the future. Uh, to enhance the, uh, the reality of real crime centers. Real crime centers uh, have turned around many jurisdictions, and I, I know that it will make this place a safer place. Thank you. And Vice Chairman Ehrman, your second is amended as well? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Commissioner Adams, has your question has been answered? Or do you um, have additional? I, yeah, well, I do. My questions related to the cameras have been answered. The only comments I would make about the license plate readers, and I understand that is not a decision of ours, that is your policy decision, is because there was an article yesterday. Um, I've had several phone calls from concerned residents. They were concerned with how and what the policy of the Sheriff's Department was related to where these will be located. And um, then also, again, as we discussed last week, um, policies related to storage access and oversight um, and, and what and how that was going to be handled. So, Without a doubt. Absolutely. Please feel free to send any of those constituents to me, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to talk to them. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so, Eric, just as an example, say a 911 calls, call comes in, um, a bank on US-1 in downtown was robbed. The getaway vehicle is a white SUV, and the first three digits of the license plate is ABC. So the thought is then, with the license plate readers and access to our live traffic cameras, you can then say, okay, we have a white SUV with ABC. It's westbound on State Road 60 heading towards I-95 or something like that, which would then allow you to direct your law enforcement response. Is that kind of... Absolutely correct. The reality of it is more than likely um, we're going to have somebody who enters our jurisdiction or is driving somewhere that uh, their license plate has been flagged for some reason, whether it's a stolen vehicle or, um, you know, they're a suspect in a, in a murder, or, you know, anything like that. Uh, we will immediately get an alert on that prior to the event, you know, as soon as they cross that that camera uh, and then we'll able, be able to through our real-time crime center direct our resources to stop that vehicle safely and be able to take that person into custody 
So yes, it's great technology. And on the uh, other side of this, when we do have a homicide or we do have a bank robbery and you have a witness who says, I only got the first character. I only got a limited information. All I know was it was a white truck. We're able to go back and see what vehicles came through in that time period to solve those cases. We actually have an mm. example of that. There was a theft out at Cuisineau Jewelers at 58th and 60. It was a group out of Miami that was coming into our area co committing thefts. They were putting this particular tag on multiple different vehicles and we were able to identify uh, and are continuing to work that case as a result. So we're already making a, a big difference as a result of these cameras. Great, good, thank you. Commissioner Moss, you have yes. a comment? Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I strongly support the sheriff in utilizing technology to uh, capture criminals, and he is capturing criminals. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful work. And I especially want to um, commend your ability to communicate with the community. I have a friend who lives out on uh, 510, in western part of the county and this happened a couple of weeks ago true story and there was a criminal on the loose and you were uh, broadcasting live you know from the scene and she had already you know taken her gun out and she lives alone she had taken her gun out put it on put it on the night nightstand because the the person had the criminal had not been apprehended yet and she she saw you broadcasting that in fact the criminal now had been apprehended and she just you know, she could sleep that night. Thank so, you. so thank you for what you do in reaching out to the community. This is an example of it, of you know, com being completely transparent, and explaining it so well, and that's that was another example. So I com I commend you for it. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a great plug to remind everybody. Please download our app. Go online, download our app in your app store, so you can get those alerts in real time. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion? Yeah, we learned something that uh, perhaps maybe upon your retirement you might be able to. Uh, move on to the uh, sheriff's office dispatch unit. Yeah, maybe so. Well, no, no, Rich, Rich is already count. Count. Rich wants me for traffic that, engineering. That, that on the fly? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, okay. All right, any other um, comments from the commissioners? I did have, I did have, uh, did have Commissioner Ehrman. Yeah, first of all, so, I mean, that was a very awesome description. Sounds like you were, you know, you were right there. He was pursued in the past. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'd get after him. Sheriff, I do want to say thank you for this. I, I'm a, a big supporter of this, but I do uh, appreciate the transparency and I appreciate the county administrator for his wanting this to, to be very transparent on this, to let the public know what is going on and how we're doing it. Again, this is not an invasion of anybody's privacy or anything like that. It's a tool for law enforcement. And uh, I think it's a, a really good idea. And I'm, I'm proud to, to be up here to support your, your efforts. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, Rich Spirica. You... <laughs> Rich Spirica, Public Works Director. Uh, I just want to make sure I have clear direction. I, I've been listening. I, I need you guys to understand that these traffic cameras only point in a single direction. You may get a leg of a four-legged intersection when they're coming through. So I need you guys to understand that you're not going to be able to follow vehicles through intersections when the camera is stat static and it's looking at one leg. I just need you guys to understand that. Uh, you know, Eric's talking about, Sheriff Flowers is talking about, you know, using it for looking at, you know, crimes and things like that and following vehicles. That, that's not the case with the traffic cameras. I, I really need you guys to understand that. Um, you know, I, I applaud his, his bringing the sheriff's office into the 21st century. You know, we're all doing that. It's great technology. But I, I just, again, I need you to understand that that's not what he's going to see when he pulls up a traffic camera. It's going to be a snapshot of maybe if the camera is pointed north on, let's say, State Road 60 and, and uh, 58th Avenue, he's not going to see State Road 60. He's just going to see the northbound, east, north and south leg of the north side of State Road 60. So just be aware of that, that you know this will be a good function for them, but it's just gonna end up wherever the camera is. The last time my guys used it to look at traffic, they may be just looking at a turn lane. They may just be looking at traffic backup. So I just, I, I wanna make sure you guys understand that. But it's in the- So you're just saying that there, there will be limitations to what the sheriff will be able to glean from looking at the traffic camera. That, that is correct. And, and we recognize that. I understand that it's not perfect. That right. we're not asking for control over it. I understand that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get control over it. But um, you know, it is an additional tool for us. You know, we have the same situation with the school cameras. Our real time crime center has access to those. We don't set them up. We don't design them. But we get access to it, and it may help us in an active shooter situation. So I'd rather have them than not. And that's where I'm going. 
So let me then just throw out a scenario, Rich. Um, the one of the license plate readers captures a car getting off the interstate and heading eastbound on State Road 60 in, into the heart of the county. It's flagged. Sheriff Flowers gets that information. Can he call you and say, hey, we've got a potential crime car westbound on State Road 60. Would we be able to assist the sheriff with the cameras? Okay. Yeah, we, we, we don't have that staff 24 7 and, and you know, we. It's, you know. it's not staff 24 7, first of all. Second of all, if we have the camera, because we have cameras every other intersection, but mm -hmm. if we have cameras there, we may or may not get it. By the time he calls us, it's already gone through, and who knows where the person is by then. And my staff is already dedicated to keeping traffic flowing in the, in the county. And, so and that's just not a door we need in my opinion we need to open without i mean if we want to go down that road he you know it's it's going to take extra staff well and and staff i i also want to point out that some of these traffic cameras and the fiber connected to them was funded by dot so we could be bumping up to the same things that the sheriff's seeing with dot on the state because a lot of this infrastructure was at least partially funded from the state so the way we view it is by just the, the read only access if you will that the, it's what you see is what you get you know whichever way the traffic cameras happen to be pointed it's kind of like an ancillary use if we start getting into directing um the cameras too much then we're, we're worried about a, a problem on our end with the with the dot um resources that that, that have been deployed there let me say it's a start yes right it's better than nothing Many cities do it way better than you do. You're behind the curve on the plate readers. They're, they adapt to the, that situation, and it's a beginning. It's a start. We, we could get better. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate your comments. Is there anyone uh, from the public that wishes to comment on this item? Hmm. Okay. Seeing none, just to review the motion is to approve access to the county traffic cameras and to allow the installation of the license plate readers within county right-of-way. Dylan and the clerk, you all clear on that? Okay. Commissioners, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. So Sheriff, you. thank you. Oh. Hold up, Sheriff, Sheriff, Sheriff. Just Really, nothing even more for Jason. Do we need to authorize the, the fiber optic cost or anything like that to do that, or is that something we can do later? Or is, there is that something we already had to do? Yeah, if you want to, if if you want to do that, that would be a good thing because I don't think we currently have that budgeted in the in the current fiscal year. Um, it is about a seven hundred and three thousand dollar expense, I think, is the quote we've got. So, if you want to do that, that we can then we can bring a budget amendment back to do that. We've we we can we can find the dollars if, if you guys authorize that. Actually, um, why don't we do that when we get to the capital improvement yeah, element? That's great. If you're great, okay, that's just wait idea. and yep. we'll do it then. Okay. Moving on to public items, public hearings. Ten A one is the biosolids moratorium extension ordinance. This is legislate, legislative in nature and Mr. Rheingold. Thank you very much. In uh, July of 2018, the board enacted a moratorium on the land application of biosol class B biosolids. Class uh, B biosolids uh, can contain phosphorus and nitrogen, which can lead to and promote algae blooms. Uh, that moratorium has been uh, extended on several occasions by the Board of County Commissioners, and the current moratorium is set to expire on December, on January 1st, 2022. So thus, the County Attorney's Office is bringing back uh, an ordinance to extend the moratorium once again for another one-year period through January 1st, 2023. Uh, per Section 403.0855, Florida Statutes, county is permitted to extend its moratorium. And that's county uh, attorney's office simply recommends that the board open up the public hearing, take any public comments, close the public hearing, and approve the ordinance. And with that, I am available for any questions. Thank you, Dylan. Commissioners, any questions of staff? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this? You know, back four years ago, I, when I was chairman, I appointed then Commissioner Slarry to be the uh, chairman of my poop committee. 
and the sole member of the poop committee. Um, and I did reach out to him and let him know this would be on the agenda. I kind of thought he would be here to cheer us on, but I think in, he's, he's here with us in spirit to do the right thing here. So anyone from the public? Last call. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Commissioners. Mr. Chair, move uh, to extend the biosolids Second. moratorium. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Moss. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Next, 10A2 is the county initiated request to amend the five-year capital improvements program in the capital improvements element of the comprehensive plan for the period fiscal year 21-22 through 2025-26. And with that, Mr. Matson, you'll kick it off. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Phil Matson, Community Development Director. And I'd like to reintroduce John Stull. Uh, John is our Air Force veteran, speaking of the air show and the, and the balloons uh, exposition. I think he's going to find himself right at home here. John is, uh, has to go no further than the Thanksgiving table to get seasoned advice from an experienced planner. His father was the planning director of Austin, Texas. And uh, though, though we'll miss Bill, but John, John is stepping up uh, largely here, and uh, I think you're really going to like the capital improvement element he's going to present to you. But before I turn it over to him, I want to make a few uh, points about the capital improvement element. So for starters, uh, this is the activity that's most like what I'm most used to through the majority of my career uh, and what we did at the MPO. And to put it in simple terms, I think we're taking our vision as a, as a commission and a board of what we want to see. We want to see improvements in the county, in the quality of life, while not changing who we are as a county. And I think the capital improvement element that you're going to see really, really nails it. I think it does a magnificent job of really striking that balance. And uh, it's the culmination of a lot of effort of, of different departments. I mean, under, under Jason's guidance and nobody better than him in, in budgeting. And Kristen, uh, John coordinated the available resources, reached out to all the county departments, and put together everything that we need in one capital improvement element. And finally, I just want to say this is only part of the picture. You know, DOT separately, those of you uh, who attended the MPO meeting, which is everybody up there, uh, we saw MP the DOT work program at an unprecedented level, $300 million. And everything in that is great. Uh, we've got the extension of the trail out to Felsmere, which you won't see on here, but it's an element that kind of preserves our historic resources and you know, it acknowledges the value that we place on recreation and, and green spaces. And uh, replacement of the uh, Sebastian uh, Inlet Causeway, where we're now going to have improvements all around. Uh, the capital improvement element is the county's contribution toward that. Uh, Public Works is the predominant uh, person who carries out the elements of the capital improvement element and very, very productive. Uh, I've, I've been doing this 34 years. I can't remember a small county having this many major road projects going on at once, and uh, that's very much to their credit, so I just wanted to call that out as well. So with that, John, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce the capital improvement element and all the good things in it. Thank you for that introduction, Phil. There you go. So what you have before you is the county initiated request to amend the capital improvement element of the comprehensive plan. So the purpose of the comprehensive plan text amendment today is to recognize changes in existing and future public facility needs and changes in funding. And this is also to comply with the yearly CIE update requirements of the state law and county comprehensive plan policy. Uh, so for the CIE adoption process, it's uh, different from standard plan amendments. Uh, this one will only require one public hearing and the Planning and Zoning Commission does not need to review it. There will also be no state agency review. Uh, as Phil mentioned, this is a joint effort by several county departments. It's managed by planning staff and really directed by the budget department. So we'll highlight the changes for this one. Um, we updated the existing revenue information and updated revenue projections. We updated Appendix A, as well as um, the rest of the appendices, Indian River County five-year schedule of capital improvements, and the updated revised all tables, figures, and corresponding text within the element. Um, this five-year CIP is for fiscal year 2021-22 to fiscal year 2025-26. Uh, 
the total five-year CIP expenditure increased by 12% from $407,151,386 last year to $456,910,360. Uh, projected revenues will match the projected expenses, and the level of service standards will be maintained. Um, again, transportation is the largest category. The total expenditure is at 40.5%. Um, here you'll see all of the categories for the, um, Appendix A of the CIP. Um, you have coastal management, conservation and aquifer recharge, emergency services, facilities management, law enforcement and corrections, recreation and open space, sanitary sewer and potable water, solid waste, stormwater management, and again, transportation. Um, let's see, the total is 456,310,360. Transportation makes up the largest component of that at 184,969,987. And the second highest is sanitary sewer and potable water at 98,371,499. Um, some notable capital projects. I think Phil touched on a couple of these, but we have the 14th Street Railway Improvements. Um, we have a Jackie Robinson Training Complex and Walking Trail, a canal treatment system in the North Relief Canal. Uh, Sandridge Golf Club uh, House renovations, Lost Tree Islands Conservation Area enhancements. Should be the, it's the second slide didn't get in there, but but the second slide merits a little discussion as well. Uh, yes, I have a. So well, um, additionally, the Lost Tree Island Conservation Area enhancement, um, the Emergency Operations Center at three million three hundred seventy-five thousand, broadband expansion at three million four hundred thirteen thousand seven hundred forty-four and a Sheriff Headquarters renovation at 5,200,000. Um, in 2016, the Board of County Commissioners directed staff to commit to spending 20% of the proceeds of the first five years of the extended one cent local option sales tax on lagoon related projects. Um, this proposed five year CIP allocates more than the 20% of the projected one cent local option sales revenue to lagoon related projects for fiscal year 21, 22 to 25, 26. Um, some of those projects include the North Sebastian Highland West Wabasso Sewer, um, Floribane Shores Septic to Sewer, Lost Tree Islands Restoration and Replanting, Indian River Lagoon Greenway Wetland Restoration, Jones Pier Wetland Creation and Shoreland Enhancements. Um, additionally, the North Relief Canal Treatment System, previously mentioned, Stormwater Marsh Projects, TMDL Lagoon Treatment System, um, and the Hallstrom Farmstead Water Sewer and Restrooms. Um, so in summary, we have an increased forecasted revenue, uh, projected time frames have been extended and project costs have been modified. The level of service standards have been ma maintained. We've met the 20% requirement for the one cent local option sales tax for lagoon related projects. The CIE is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the CIE is financially feasible. So our recommendation is that the Board of County Commissioners approve the update to the five-year capital improvement program for the period of FY 2021-22 to 25-26 and supporting data analysis of the capital improvements element of the comprehensive plan by adopting the proposed ordinance. That concludes this presentation. Thank you, John and Phil. Uh, commissioners, any questions of staff? I have one under transportation on the line item, the uh, actual CIE. Um, widening of 26th Street from 43rd Avenue to 66th Avenue. I thought a couple years ago we actually had construction funds allocated for this, and now we do not. So I guess the question is, is are we behind with the right-of-way acquisition, or why are we not moving on uh, construction of this? Can you repeat that line item? It's 26th Street from 43rd Avenue to 66th Avenue. Okay, yes, the, the reason that one, we pushed that one back because of right away. Two things, number one, there's 912 units that are coming in that are gonna be funding some of that as part of a development that's in the city that's gonna access 43rd Avenue, 26th Street, and 58th Avenue. Number two is, is we still need seven pieces of right away along there and that we can't go into eminent domain until I have design plans. The developer's on the hook to do the design plans. Um, if we move forward, which is my plan to move forward with design plans because we need that leg done um, right now, so that's why that's got pushed back. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of balls in the air we're juggling around, so there was no sense in allocating the money that would not get funded, so we looked at it from a holistic standpoint and knowing what's going on in the world with development, and we, we just pushed it back. 
It's coming. Is that the development at the corner of 43rd Avenue, northwest corner of 43rd and 26th Street, the old golf course? Yes, sir. Okay. The old golf course. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Adams. Um, I don't know exactly who this is for, but Jason, we recently had some issues at the Archie Smith Fish House, and I don't know um, if that's something that needs to be moved up in the I know it's it really just happened so we, we might not even know what we're going to be doing yet but is that something we need to move up in the CIE to address yeah I'll ask Mike to get us Good started morning Mike Zito assistant county administrator yes our, our um, activity out there now is to stabilize what has collapsed and mm -hmm. we may be moving some of that capital improvement money forward that was designed for stabilization project after we presented a larger project to the board that did not get approved now we're in the, in the mode of um, stabilizing the area. We removed some debris from the lagoon. Everything's stable there. Now we're trying to get Indian River docks out there to stabilize the situation, and we'll probably be moving some of that project money forward to do that. So do you want, is that something we need to do today, or is that something that you're going to bring back once you kind of have a better assessment, or what's the game plan there? I, I'd like to bring a plan back, because that, is, as you know, just happened over the weekend. We do have funds in the five-year plan for, for some of that restoration, but I think we want to kind of get our arms around exactly what we need to do now and, and kind of come with a plan, to, and, and then we can we can come back with, a, with an amendment, uh, you know, uh, as we go forward. First reaction, Commissioner, is to consider preserving it as much photographically as we can, um, considering the pros and cons of, of demolition, and because the dock's already rebuilt. And right. Well, my concern is exactly that word that you're discussing is demolition, yeah. because I personally would, would not be in favor of that. We purchased the property, the county purchased the property before my time with the commitment to do something there um it's been an extremely long time and i and i understand why but we're finally moving forward with something and it is an integral part of the working waterfront in the sebastian area it's a key piece of history um, to that fishing commercial fishing industry and in light of um what is going on with the city of sebastian and hurricane harbor i i don't I, I really think that it is our responsibility to do as much as we can to preserve and keep that building um, in good shape so we can go ahead and move forward with the plans that we ha that the county had when they purchased it. So that's why I'm saying if this needs to be moved up so we can ensure that yeah. further degradation of the building doesn't happen, then, you know, I'm we need to have that conversation we'll bring you some options okay. certainly include that discussion for now um we had staff out there yesterday beth did you want to comment on it yeah beth powell assistant director of parks and conservation resources uh we had staff evaluate uh the site yesterday unfortunately the ice house um, is continuing to collapse into the lagoon so our first measure is to uh, install a turbidity curtain or some other um, containment uh, measure for the adjacent Captain Butcher's dock because the debris and everything is floating out into the lagoon. Um, and then aside from that, we'll be removing that if we can. It does appear that the roof is collapsing as well, so there may not be um, a lot to salvage. Uh, the county did apply for a Division of Historical Resources grant in 2019. Unfortunately, that was a large category grant, and there were a lot of things going on, and that project was not funded, and it was specifically to address the piers um, that had been identified as rotten uh, and to do some structural reinforcement on the ice house itself. And so I think we're <clears throat> past that point. Um, the good thing is that we do have the uh, Atlier did uh, the plans through uh, a previous Division of Historical Resources grant um, that was actually part of the larger um, plan that we had for the site. We had found that the plans were not really buildable, um, unfortunately. I mean, they would have preserved it, but for instance, the pilings had to be lowered in from a crane through the roof. Um, and when we started talking to contractors, it was gonna be um, a really big challenge uh, to do it the way that the plans had been designed. So the grant that we had written uh, and, and had proposed would have addressed those kinds of build buildability issues um, and as well as addressing the structural integrity of the ice house. 
Um, it will be helpful for us to have some board direction as we move forward. Um, we can bring back um, the status of what's, um, you know, what's what with the building. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how much is going to be salvageable, though, just to let you know um, based on the, um, the site visit that we've conducted. Uh, in addition to that, it looks like that there are some uh, timbers on the actual house itself uh, that have started to collapse. I don't know if there was a high wake event or something that maybe contributed to that, but um, we will also need to be looking at the small house um, at the same time. Yeah, so as long as we're moving forward on something sooner rather than later, because as you say, it's until it's addressed, it's going to get worse. And the worse it gets, the more expensive it costs, and the less we have as many options available. Yeah, and if you, if you want to put something in there now, the, the first thing we have is $200,000 in the second year of the CIP for the restoration of the fish house. We could, you know, if you want to advance something just to, for, for us to have some resources in the current year, um, we, we'd be agreeable to that. Um, I think this is something that is um, part of a larger lesson learned from our previous two land acquisition bond issues. Um, we are, I think, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done over the last five plus years to um, take the sites that we've purchased, whether they were environmental or historical or agricultural, um, and, and kind of improve those, Jones Pier, things like that, the Indian River Lagoon Greenway um, projects and, and Sebastian Harbor Preserve and more. Um, but I think, you know, as you know, there, there's, there's a question out there of whether we do a, 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 another land bond. I would recommend that if we do that, that we set aside, if, if we acquire property, we also set aside an amount for the initial improvements. Because I think what we have here in this situation for Archie Smith was we bought the money, sp bought the property, spent all of the bond dollars, didn't really have the resources to, to, um, to do what we needed to do to preserve that. And uh, so we found ourselves dependent on grants, and we had a we had a we had various different options a couple of years ago that we, we that that the board made a determination to do you know phase one if you will and not move forward on on a larger thing because of some of the costs. So I think this is kind of a lessons learned for going forward that we want to make sure when we're acquiring property we're also kind of setting aside the resources to uh, to to take care of that property whether it needs to be rehabbed or initial improvements on uh, on on, on uh, the environmental property. I completely agree with that. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Um, so, Jason, we have, um, as you mentioned, the 200000 in optional sales tax for the Archie Smith Fish House restoration for 22-23. You're suggesting we move that up into the 21-22 fiscal year? Right, and that gives us something that's in the current Working. year. We'll, we'll probably need to come back and amend that again. But if, if we if we want to have something in the in the current year, so that we can we can start spending dollars, um, if you want to do that, that that okay. would be All staff right. would support that. And then Jason, under the um, Commissioner Airman's the fiber optic, we have 1.5 million budgeted for the current fiscal year. Do you just need us to approve? using 700,000 of that for the sheriff's link or do we need to move additional funds? I think we'd like an additional 750,000 in year one. Okay, and where would that be coming from? Sales tax? Uh, sales tax contingency, okay. yep. So, um, so before I open the, the public hearing, we have two um, uh, changes to the comprehensive improvement element plan. We're going to move 200000 from fiscal year 22-23 into fiscal year 21-22 for the Archie Smith Fish House. And where Jason gets it, we're going to move 750000 of optional sales tax additional into fiscal year 21-22 for traffic fiber optic. Is that coming, is that coming out of 22-23 and just moving in to 20, the same as we're doing for Archie Smith, or is that... I think we'd be looking at additional there additional, for that. Additional. Okay. So the traffic fiber optic funding for 22-23 will not be changed. We're just going to add to fiscal year 21-22. Everybody on board? Commissioner Fleischer? Mr. Chairman, I had something else. 
it's unrelated, but yes, I am on board. Okay. Uh, you know, there's, uh, th there's a uh, facility that uh, over the years we've done quite a bit of um, cosmetics, uh, but it's long overdue, and that's the comfort and relief stations in the Victor Hart uh, Recreational Facility. Um, and I don't know if this is the, uh, the, the timing, whether, uh, and I anticipated it being on there, because uh, I know that we said we would be doing that within the very near future, but uh, they are not uh, each year, uh, if there's any uh, gathering of significance, uh, they're, they're always shut down. It's problematic. It needs a little bit more than just a cosmetic approach, and uh, I thought it, it would appear on uh, this CIE. It, I believe it will be a capital improvement. Uh, it's not, uh, again, a, a cosmetic approach or a minor plumbing job. And uh, I believe that uh, we had talked about it last year and said that uh, we'd uh, be looking at it this current year. We, we do have 400000 budgeted for fiscal year 22-23 for the Victor Hart Complex restroom and concession. Eight, page A-10. Okay. We do have 400000 for that. Will that cover it? I believe. I believe that's our estimated cost. Number we have on it right now. It's a bit unpredictable, but it's certainly yeah. a foundation to work with. There, several restrooms in the county are in the pipeline for uh, park renovation or replacement, including Hobart. Uh, Hobart, and we we did have a challenge in South County as well. Yes. As we grow, the facilities are being used more and more, and uh, the, the burden has gained on, on, on the facilities, but they are weakened. So, happy to see it's done. Thank you. Go ahead and open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on the county's five-year capital improvement element? Yes, sir. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Wilfred Hart. 1719 Play Southwest, Vero Beach, Florida. I didn't have any plans to come up here and speak, but uh, since uh, Commissioner Fletcher talked about it, and, and uh, I just came up here to say thank you. It's long overdue. We've talked about it for years now, and uh, I think next year will be a fine time to get that and some other projects uh, completed, like the canopy that uh, I have been discussing now. Someone suggested that if we contact Impact 100, they might be able to throw in $100,000 on their project, somebody to write a grant. And so we, we, that's just something that uh, a lot of folks in the community, which I have not lived in Gifford full time since I was 17 years old, but it's dear to my heart as well as this county. And, 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 and what's so important is when we do do projects, at the Victor Hart Senior, who was my father, at the Victor Hart Senior Community Enhancement Complex, it actually opened the doors for other parts to get uh, some facelifts as well. And so when, when I, <coughs> I have noticed over the years that when we do do projects out there, the other, pro the other parts reach the benefits as well. So, so keep doing what you're doing. And uh, we're going to ask and we're going to scratch and we're going to keep begging that, you know, you put my father's name on that. Thank you very much, Commissioner Fletcher. I just want to thank you very much for that and the, and the board that did it. And, and I believe that he just deserves something that's, that's really nice. He's 90 years old, he'll be 91 next month. And um, I just want to take him out there to show him all the improvements that have been going on. So again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to comment? Seeing none, having provided ample time, I'll close public hearing. Commissioners, we have a five-year capital improvement element that we have made two adjustments to. Is there any other discussion or action? Um, I, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Moss. Um, with regard to that, the heart uh, complex, I know there are other improvements uh, that are required. Uh, for example, the 
tennis courts there, and uh, I guess it's a handball court. You know, it's cracked, and the bleachers are broken. And there, I, I, I submitted photos uh, months ago. Is that something uh, that needs to be, be part of this? And what, um, what, what would the dollar amount be if it does need to be part of this? Those, the part of not qualify as capital improvements. The good news is that they're uh, actually in progress. Oh, okay. Um, and should be commenced very soon. Uh, within weeks so if that's not okay. the case I'll follow up with you but my last report was they were getting ready to let those projects to begin before the end of the year so all, all of those projects uh, will, 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 will be addressed look at the bleachers that you mentioned but the resurfacing projects have been procured and are ready to be let okay, okay. And, we, and we already have funding for that that's yes. not uh, out of, out doesn't of, need to be in here existing budget it does not need existing to be budget system. okay all right, very good. Thank you for the clarification. The team was out working on it yesterday. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, Commissioner Jason. Yes. Yeah, just just for clarification, that additional seven fifty for the fiber for the for the sheriff's um, cameras, we'd like that in the facilities portion. There's a line for fiber optic mm -hmm. under facilities rather than under traffic. So if we could, you know, just a clarification on that for staff, that'll be seven fifty additional in facilities uh, fiber rather than seven fifty additional traffic fiber okay. under the transportation section. Very good. Commissioners. Second. As amended with the two as, as with the two amendments, yeah. Um, a motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Flesher. Just one comment I have, Commissioners, there's funds budgeted for right away collection or right away acquisitions on forty third Avenue from Oslo Road to 18th Street to widen four lanes. I've been opposed to this for the last 15 years. I'm still opposed to it. And later in the agenda, we're going to have a right-of-way acquisition where we're, going to, where we're eating a whole house. And I'll just point out to you that 43rd Avenue is very narrow, and we're going to be eating a lot of houses on that project. And I just don't think you all are going to – I won't be here, but I just don't think you all are going to be able to afford to do it with what we're paying for right-of-way. So I just – do, do my final soap opera stance here on this, but um, I, I just don't see it being financially feasible. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'll continue to carry that banner for you after you leave, at least for a couple more years. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion uh, to approve the amended, the two amendments on the capital improvement plan. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. We're going to take a 10-minute break. We will reconvene at 10.52.
We will bring the meeting back to order. Moving on now is public discussion items. We have a request to speak from Joseph Paladin, re, uh, Community Development Districts. Mr. Paladin, good morning and welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners, county administrator, county attorney, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, last week I brought forward uh, a, a project or brought forward a discussion on CDDs. Um, didn't mean for that to be involved or confused with specific <coughs> projects, but it sort of was. Anyway, in uh, coming forward today, uh, I think that the bringing forward a CDD at this time is bad timing, the wrong time, and I think the wrong place. So I like to put that to bed. I'm, I'm not trying to bring forward any CDDs at this time, nor do I see me bringing forward any in the near future. I'm not saying I'm not going to bring forward projects, <clears throat> but I'll bring forward uh, projects with their own financing and their own approvals under the current zoning laws and rules and regulations that we have at this time. So that's my statement. I'd like to apologize for the county commissioners or the county staff or the county administrator for bringing things through and not having the complete support like I usually do. So if I was out of line in any way, you have my apology. Thank you, Mr. Paladin. And uh, part of what we decided last week was we wanted to move forward with outlining some criteria for any future CDD. And we had asked you to put some folks together to look at this. Um, I'll wait and see what the board wants to do. But if we continue to move forward, did you still want to participate in those discussions going forward? I only do that if I have the full support of the uh, county commissioners. Personally, I, I, I have no problem with you participating. I think we, um, <clears throat> I think what the board wanted last week was to get as much input from all aspects, um, different developers and builders, architects, engineers, whoever, uh, the citizens, groups, RNA, everybody, and help us put together a list of criteria. Um, I believe that, you know, this is going to come back to us probably sooner than later. So I think we need to go ahead and continue to move forward and, and be prepared for the next one and I think we want to do that with a lot of community input so um, I would certainly be pleased to have you to be part of that discussion yeah. Commissioner Adams no. <clears throat> oh. no, please go ahead. I was gonna say I, I would concur with that statement I think we are you know we need to, to set out what our parameters are going to be for future CDDs or I think it's something that we will see eventually and we may as well go ahead and have the conversation now so it comes from a a well thought out planning standpoint versus um, an after the fact rushed matter. So I, I would like to see the process continue to move forward, or the discussions anyway, and, and I'm pleased to have you be a part of that um, to the extent that, that you want to be involved in it, for sure. Uh, Mr. Flusher. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> as Mr. Pallon points out, it's not the uh, proper place uh, nor the time, uh, and uh, I I believe that it's not the proper place for even a longer time, uh, but uh, that being the case, if the ad hoc committee were able to be uh, developed and that was the finding, that would be okay too. I mean, it, you know, uh, once again, we want to look at parameters, but that's not to say that we're going in that direction. That means that, uh, you know, th this could be something that's discovered that it's not appropriate for. Uh, what we're doing here in Indian River County, uh, how we're moving forward, how we're growing, and uh, what's to be accomplished. Uh, again, it's a, it's a financial tool, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's very complicated, and I believe that uh, it, it, if that's the process, if it's found that not, it's not appropriate, it's not appropriate. So I, I don't want to uh, be led to believe that this is going to be, let's set the parameters so we can start accepting these applications. Uh, I, I believe that there's a great discussion that needs to be involved. Mr. Chairman Ehrman, any comments? Uh, I would agree with, with uh, my fellow commissioners, uh, with Commissioner Adams and, and uh, Commissioner Bryan and Commissioner Blusher about this. And this is a financial tool to, to be used in the right time at the right place. And Mr. Bellin and I would want you to be in this uh, committee with with your knowledge of the county LDRs and everything that's going that, that we've done here over the years I think you'd, you'd you'd be an asset and it wouldn't be the same without you because 
uh, your class act and no apologies needed, by the way. Commissioner Moss? Uh, the community, I did not hear any support for this whatsoever. Um, so I do not support going forward with anything to do with the CDD at this point, including committees or, or meetings. I think by the time there may be a need for this, it'll be outdated and we'll just have to do it all over again anyway. Thank you. Thank you. So Dylan, um, my recollection of last week is the board did have a motion and move forward um, to get input from the community, possibly hold a workshop or two, and work on developing um, guidelines for any future CDD application. Did you need any further action at this point in time, or are you good under that vote from last week? Well, I guess for me, what's changed is what I've heard from uh, Mr. Paladin, um, not just today, but in our other conversations, was that he was not interested in establishing a sort of a separate private non-county committee. It wasn't interested in running one, which was kind of where we were leading out of the gate from the last meeting. With that being said, I've heard from a couple commissioners who are not really wanting to continue forward with the CDD discussion. I've heard from a couple commissioners that we may need to prepare for future CDDs. I, in the context of all that, I guess the one thing I can offer is if the board wants me to do so, I'd be happy to just open up building B one day in January or February, invite various people, including Mr. Paladin, others who've expressed interest in the CDD concept, or at least knowing more about it, and just kind of having a round table discussion with folks and saying, do you want to put input to what this may or may not be, and then kind of bring that sort of comment report to the board for potential future action. Is it, That's the best I can kind of come up with between what happened last week and this week. That seems appropriate. Okay. I would be happy to attend those meetings that uh, Mr. Dillon puts together. I'm always happy to attend a meeting for the county to be helpful in any way, shape, or form. Then would you like a, a motion to that effect? I mean, I'm fine with consensus. If you guys just understand that what will happen is January, February, I'll have a just a meeting of Building B, it'll be open to various folks. I'll do my best to invite as many people as possible, um, and I'll be there to take in comments, and then the county attorney's office will report back to the board in February or March time period. Commissioner Fletcher, Commissioner Ehrman, Commissioner Adams. I believe Commissioner Moss, you'd be opposed. Yeah, I'm not. I, yeah, right, so we, yeah. we have Why don't we do, four. We'll do a motion then. If, uh, it, well, can we make a motion? Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Speak? Um, I think. So just how I look at this is normally we do not make motions in public discussion. However, this directly kind of impacts a motion that we made last week under a public hearing. So given that we're kind of changing uh, what, what happened last week, I, I think I would be okay with having a motion to give staff clarification. Once again, I'm, I'm happy to make that motion if that's requested to do so with the understanding that this, uh, this may not be the right time, place uh, to go forward, and uh, that's my anticipation, but uh, I'll be happy to do that to be consistent with our past uh, decision. Okay, so uh, you are making the motion? Yes. Okay. I'll be glad to second that. Um, any further discussion? I do, a, okay. I do have a question. Yes, Commissioner Adams. Um, my understanding at the meeting was that there was other people that were interested and being on this kind of exploratory committee besides Mr. Paladin. What if those people are still interested in moving forward? Because I, I, I don't know if we particularly a, appointed one person as the, as the committee yeah, I've spoke, organizer. So <clears throat> I've spoken to um, Andrew Kennedy and Chuck Meckling, who are the two people who spoke. And they, <clears throat> they both have interest in participating, and if they do, that's their decision, and they do have interest. And I would participate in anything that the county asked me to participate in. I've never turned down uh, working with the county or helping with the county. All I said is I wasn't interested in forming a committee going forward and chairing it without full support from all five county commissioners. And, and I believe what Dylan has kind of suggested, instead of kind of any formal committee, we would just schedule a workshop and gather public input from all the interested parties. I'm just curious if I'm, how that was <coughs> yep. all working together. Thank okay. you. So we have a motion from Commissioner Flesher, second by myself, to have the county attorney conduct a workshop. Yeah. 
Yep. And just for clarification, I, I I appreciate Dylan offering to to host that, and I and I think that's the appropriate place to just want to right. mention you know community development staff will will support that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. We too. we expect all county staff to all right. participate. All right. All right. Anyone from the public wish to comment on this? Seeing none. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. That motion carries four to one with Commissioner Moss in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Paladin. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Rheingold, if you would do the pleasure of reading the public notice item, please. Absolutely. We have a uh, notice of a public hearing, which will be scheduled for January 11th. This will be Meritage Homes' request for a concurrent uh, conceptual plan development PD plan, special exception and preliminary PD plan approval for 150 detach single family homes at an overall density of 2.72 units per acre to be known as Hampton Park PD. Uh, and this will be quasi-judicial in nature. And again, this will be held on January 11th, uh, 2022. And with that, I turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Dylan. We now move to county administrative matters, uh, the 2022 Indian River County State Legislative Program. And I believe Kathleen will kick this off for us. Good morning. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Kathleen Forst. I'm still getting used to my new last name. So uh, Kathleen Forst, <laughs> Legislative Affairs and Communications Manager. Um, the 2022 Florida Legislative Session will convene in Tallahassee on Tuesday, January 11th, 2022, and will run through March 11th, 2022. Um, staff has put together a final proposed legislative program for your consideration which includes appropriations for our Exora Park and Hobart Water Treatment Plant upgrade projects. Staff has also prepared a draft list of designated point persons and alternates for the 2022 state legislative list of priorities. Um, the proposed list maintains um, the 2021 designated priority um, point persons and alternates. Um, staff proposes removing the high-speed passenger rail priority following the recent settlement agreement with Brightline. Um, and adding two new priorities focusing on preemption and water infrastructure. Um, staff recommends that the board approve the final proposed legislative program for the 2022 state legislative session. Um, we also recommend the board provide some direction and guidance on the draft list of designated point persons and alternates for the 2022 state legislative priorities, make any changes to the list and adopt the list with any applicable changes. I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments for staff? Uh, Mr. Fletcher? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I see, uh, I, I agree on the, the two new categories uh, being applied. I, I think that uh, home rule is uh, going to be, uh, again, an, an ever-growing ever concept uh, no matter what year it is. Uh, I think it will be maintained there for a long time. And the, the water issue uh, comes near and dear to uh, our hearts. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I know that uh, uh, we've sunsetted the, uh, the endeavor for the high speed, higher speed rail, uh, which was uh, settled. And uh, I would uh, like the opportunity, I'll yield to you, sir, uh, as uh, it, it appears that uh, you're, uh, you're due a, an, another committee or something else to do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I would like the opportunity to uh, uh, be the uh, legislative point person on the water issue uh, and uh, if you deem that appropriate. Okay, thank you. I did have a couple of suggested changes on the other committees just to kind of balance things out and reflect um, uh, the, the committee assignments. So under the recycling, I was going to insert Commissioner Moss to be the point person and then under state housing initiatives and affordable housing, I was going to have Commissioner Adams replace myself on that, if that's acceptable to, okay. And then um, I'd be glad, Commissioner Flesher, if you would like to take the point on the water infrastructure. Make sure. And um, with that, then I think I'll have I had done this to try to balance everything out, so I'm trying. I'm working on the fly here now. But if I impose a change, then uh, I uh, uh, I can yield to your uh, chairmanship uh, application, sir. 
Uh, no, I think we'll be good. Um, so for water infrastructure, Commissioner Flesher will be the point and I will be the alternate. And then for preemption, uh, Vice Chairman Ehrman will be the point and the ultimate will be Commissioner Moss. And I think that keeps everybody either three or four positions to fill. So is there any comments? Anybody not like where they are? Motion to approve. Um, may, may I make one comment? Um, Let me just see if, if there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, we have Commissioner Moss second under discussion. Yes. Um, I only received this information yesterday. This was at the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District meeting. It's something we may want to consider uh, and perhaps uh, falls under the water category. But evidently there's, and you may be familiar with this, uh, Mrs. Fur, Mrs. Forst, is it Forst? Okay. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 1078 and House Bill uh, 783. And this is a uh, bill by Senator Travis Hudson, District 7, um, Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And uh, it's one sentence, so I'll read it. And it comes from their agenda uh, yesterday. Abolishing all soil and water conservation districts in this state, transferring the assets and liabilities of such districts. Um, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, this is our elected body for the community. Soil and Water Conservation District is an elected body, and please, if you don't usually get that far on the ballot, don't forget to vote, because you get to vote for them, and they represent you in this regard. Um, they are an elected body. We do have other bodies that weigh in. For example, St. John's River Water Management District, they are not elected. They are political appointees. and. Uh, some of us may recall that a year or so ago, the South Florida uh, Water Management District, that uh, they were all fired. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's uh, less reliable, shall we say. Um, so I'm, I'm very concerned about this, and I, I hope that we will uh, make it part of what we do in whatever manner uh, our legislative person and the, the chair and the rest of uh, my colleagues uh, deem to be appropriate. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. We do have a motion from Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Moss. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to comment? All in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Thank you, Kathleen Forst. We now move on to the county attorney matters, uh, acquisition of right of way from Christine L. Ford for phase two of 66 Avenue improvements, 7825 66 Avenue, parcel 126. Good morning, Mr. DeBraw. Good morning, commissioners. Bill DeBraw on behalf of the county attorney's office. Today we have the acquisition of parcel 126 uh, on 66th Avenue. The property is located on the west side of 66th Avenue between 77th and 81st Streets. The parent parcel is 7.35 acres in size. It's improved with a three bedroom, two bath house, concrete swimming pool, driveway, mature oak trees, uh, mature landscaping. There's a, 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 and a porch area that's located there as well. If you take a look at the uh, survey that was performed by the county, you can see that the highlighted area is the area of take. That's 1.76 acres in size. I've highlighted the area, and it's basically the, well, it is the front 130 feet of the property that's going to be taken. You can see the far western line uh, is the, going to be the new right-of-way line that goes behind the house through the swimming pool, uh, also impacting the bunkhouse carport type area. Uh, everything that I had listed as far as the improvements on the property are involved in the area of take. So in eminent domain, there are two main methods of valuing a parcel of property. You can use the comparable methods where you go out and you find similar properties, similarly zoned, uh, similar size, and make certain adjustments for those properties in order to arrive at a value. 
kind of like a used car. If a used car has higher miles, the price is going to be lower, but if it's got a leather interior, the price might be a little bit higher. The other method is the cost valuation. And in a cost valuation, it's used when there are uh, unique characteristics of the house that aren't commonly found in other type of houses in the area. The contractor will go through and value what it would cost to replace the house in its current condition, take a depreciation of that cost, and go ahead and establish the value, the opinion of value for the property. Here in the Ford parcel, this is kind of a country type home. It's improved with pecky cypress paneling, solid wood doors, heart of pine floors, things that you probably cannot find or duplicate, or if you would be able to duplicate them, it would come at a great cost. So what Mr. McGuire, the attorney for Mrs. Ford and, and staff uh, agreed to was to have a contractor go through and form a valuation of the property, have that uh, reviewed by an appraiser, and we chose middle of the road type appraisers and contractors. And by middle of the road, what I mean is an appraiser that had done work for government entities and also has done work for private property owners. Same thing with the contractor, that he had done work for both types of parties. The value that they arrived at was $755,700. That would be the basis for the entire settlement of the suit, meaning that would be the severance damages for the take, which would be about 25% of the property. That would mean the value of the property taken, the 1.67 acres, the house, the pool, the concrete drive, the landscaping, everything would be involved. Mrs. Ford's current plan, and it had been her plan all along, is that she would then go ahead and build her new house further west on the property, and she would be able to choose whether she wants to put in a swimming pool, a house, or whatever it, it, she, she so chooses to do. As the project nears, she would have, a, under the agreement that we've reached, she would have a year of uh, rent-free uh, extended possession. She would also be entitled to remove anything she wants to from the house uh, to install in the in the new structure that she builds. So the last recommendation in this matter is to approve the purchase and sale agreement that's attached to the agenda item for the price of $755,700. Uh, there are approximately $12,000 in costs that went to the engineer, the appraiser, and the contractor for this type of, of acquisition. Uh, I, I think that's pretty low, as we've seen in, in, in past acquisitions. The attorney's fee is a little bit better than $45,000. That was arrived at by a kind of a 6% type of realty fee uh, as far as arriving at that figure. So the total price of the acquisition is $813,488.13. That's our recommendation to approve that. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Commissioners, any questions of staff? Bill, I got one question. Yes, sir. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> no, 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 don't do it. Does it meet the O'Brien rule? You know, in, in this case, they could put up a, a fairly sizable number. You have to understand that the 755 includes everything. That means cost to cure. That means the property value. That means uh, severance damages as well. So, you know, a, a jury always gets to tour the property. They would be able to go through and see. They would be educated as well as far as if they wouldn't know what heart of pine or solid doors are or pecky cypress. They would learn those things and they would have to think like all of us here. Boy, you know, when was the last time you saw a house full of pecky cypress side or uh, paneling? I, I mean, it, it's it's a, an unusual type of, of property. Yeah. Uh, Fisher Adams? 
It's a beautiful house. It's made using construction methods that aren't used anymore. The materials you can't get, and if you can find them, they are specialty um, historical construction providers that are astronomical in cost. So, um, you know, it's an it's a very old. What year? Do you know what year it was built? It's it's a very old house, and it's. This is probably a very good deal for, I personally hate to see the house have to be removed. It's always been one of my favorites in the county. It's just, it's beautiful. It's one of those that, you know, you, you exactly what Bill said. It's a, it's a country house that you would see out on the ranch that was built by the rancher by hand. Um, but I do understand the process. I understand we can't save the trees too, Rich, but, um, Nonetheless, I, I honestly think that this is, it's, it's a very good deal, and if the homeowner is acceptable and amenable to it, I think we are um, probably in the best place we're going to be, considering the amount of take that this would require. And, and if, if I could, I'll add, you know, not wanting to speak for Commissioner O'Brien, I think one way it does satisfy the O'Brien rule and kind of the the direction of the board is most of the money is going to the Fords. So if you look at this, all of the experts and the attorneys are getting 57,000 and the Fords are getting 750. Um, the, the chance that will come in under that at trial, I think is probably pretty low. And, you know, if, if we came in at that same cost at trial, the Fords are going to end up getting less and the experts are going to end up getting more. So that's that's one re one reason I, I support it as, as staff so thank you so I, I will point out that apparently we did offer to move the house and that miss Ford declined that offer um, and apparently also miss Ford would make a very good witness for herself on the on the if it was a jury trial and I, I Jason's point that yes the, the vast majority of this is going to the landowner and not uh, out of town attorneys and appraisers and stuff. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a big number. Um, it, and it, it holds me back a little bit because when we offered to move the house and that was declined, then I started thinking, well, is the house that special really, or, or is it just being used to get a, a large dollar amount? Um, but I, you know, I, I've talked to staff on this quite a bit, and um, I think it's one of those where we just have to go with it. Um, it it's not exciting to me, but it's kind of the reality. So, Commissioner Flesher. And, you know, I had the same thoughts, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, but, you know, if we were talking about moving uh, a modular home that's made to be moved, uh, they up and lift it $15,000 later, it gets relocated, and uh, all is good. Uh, this house is, uh, has got a lot of age to it. The fasteners are very old. They might be compromised. And uh, no matter how good of a, a relo company uh, to move the house, uh, it may not be successful. And uh, we've also had that experience with other historical moves that uh, in, in all said and done, the investment didn't actually work out or pan out. And I think very well, we, we, we might uh, very well be buying uh, a pile of debris uh, if it's not moved successfully. So I did consider that as well. And I just wanted to be, be aware that we've had some unsuccessful moves as well. I do have one last question. Just for clarification, Bill, if Miss um, Ford wants to take her pecky Cypress paneling, she can take that and yes. use that in her new house or whatever pieces, and that's part of the right. agreement. Okay. The, the, right. Commissioners? I would be happy to make a motion for approval. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Vice Chairman Earman. Any final discussion on the motion? Is there anyone in the public that wishes to speak on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Bill. He pissed the test. We uh, have already taken care of the commissioner matters, so we now switch hats. And as the Solid Waste Disposal District, 
We have the meeting minutes of October 5th, 2021. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Moss, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. And then amendment number one to the wastewater treatment agreement with Indian River Sustainability Center. Oh, approval. We have a motion from Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously as well. That concludes the agenda. Uh, just like to say, um, particularly to our county staff, I wanna thank everyone for their year of work and service. I uh, wanna wish everyone with the county staff a very Merry Christmas, a happy holiday season, and a happy and safe new year. Same to my fellow commissioners. Um, I think Commissioner um, Flesher, your time as chair during the majority of this year um, was very well done. You know, we kind of thought we were done with the COVID thing and it popped up and then we got through the redistricting and things. So I want to thank you again for your, your service to the majority of 2021. And uh, just to Jason and Dylan and the other commissioners. Um, so uh, Dylan, you have fun down there where you're going. Don't start any ruckus or civil wars or anything, but behave yourself. <laughs> and uh, so to everyone, I uh, just wish you all Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a safe and happy new year. And with that, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And commissioners, we'll see you all in 2022. And with that, we're adjourned.